So I just was totally irresponsible and rebellious and uh, just a pain in the ass to all the teachers. I was uh, suspended, I don't know how many times, and expelled three times. Three times they said, Lewis, that's it, out, you're gone, your history, you ain't never gonna come back. But then uh, the school board or the teachers or the administration say, well, we can't do that, break poor old Winnie's heart, let the little jerk back in. Back in I'd come and then I'd do something awful and out I'd go again. Production of A Good Read on Maine PBS is made possible in part by the Davis Family Foundation. I always like to go in and poke around. As a matter of fact, I think I couldn't go by them without stopping, and it's the same with any old camp. It seems to me that a deserted camp is the saddest, most nostalgic thing in the world. Hi, I'm Sandy Fippen, your host for A Good Read, Writers on Writing. We're going to be meeting a lot of writers, all kinds of writers from all over Maine, at their homes, at places where they grew up, and places that continue to provide inspiration. When you first meet Gerald E. Lewis, you'll see why we chose him to be our first author in this series. For Jerry Lewis's voice is the authentic voice of the Maine storyteller. In his wonderful book, how to Talk Yankee, which has sold over 100,000 copies. Jerry defines successfully and amusingly a lot of main words spoken by the natives. For instance, in the A section, able, ah, edge on, ain't got nothing, and of course, ain't. Eh. But I want to read to you his definition of bami from the B section. Bami, adjective. Use this for irony, said of fiercely cold temperatures. It was cold up there on Spider Lake. Bammy, 35 below on the last day of February. Never did get much fishing done. Well, weren't no black flies to bother you. I first met Jerry and learned about him from his column up here in Maine, which was popular in the Bangor Daily News. Jerry grew up in Booth Bay Harbor, spent most of his adult life in the Dexter Garland area running a sheep farm and teaching school and doing hunting and fishing in Aroostook County in a hunting camp that he owns with his brother. The camp was tight then with a good roof. We loved it and never before or since have felt more at home. Our stay in camp for the next several weeks proved to be immensely gratifying, one of those interludes that is a reference point, a period of fulfillment and enjoyment against which all others are to be measured. I make this declaration not entirely dripping with the forgiveness of nostalgia since, fortunately enough, I kept a journal while we were there. It's not a good record, not complete in any way. Yet it does reflect the excitement and contentment felt by two young men in what seemed even then to be glowing times. I want to thank you, Jerry, for welcoming us to your camp. Mighty glad to have you here, Sandy. Now, this is the setting of many of your best stories. Well, yes, uh, Hal Brock figures in many of, many of my stories. I used to have an, uh, <clears throat> an outdoor column in a number of weekly newspapers, uh, hunting and fishing tips and stories, and Hal Brook was part the, of all the that. The setting, that's right. But when you talk of uh, main speech, of course, we, uh, we have to acknowledge our mentor, John Gould. That's who, right. He that's is right. the man. Uh, How to Talk Yankee was quite a success and a lot of fun to do but uh, his main lingo is the book. But main speech has changed, as you and I have noted. The, it used to be a, a difference uh, in a few miles, you mm -hmm. could tell somebody. Still, there is the Aroostook accent, thank heavens. There's still a, a Down East accent. There's still a, uh, a Portland accent. There's a Lewiston mm -hmm. accent. But it is, uh, it's, it's combining, melding, and pretty soon we'll all talk like Tom Brokaw and it won't be any fun anymore. No, I'm afraid not. I'm, I, hope, I hope not. But in dialogue, uh, I'm never conscious of, of trying to achieve an effect in dialogue. I was greatly complimented one time uh, by a reviewer who said that Lewis is a master of dialogue. I, I think that was, that was a fine compliment and I liked it. I think dialogue uh, should carry itself without any fancy verbs in the middle, he expostulated. Yes, that's such right. Thing. He said, that's good enough, mm -hmm. or maybe nothing. Right. It's more natural that way. Um, Sarah Ann Jewett, I'm sure that the language of her time was very different from ours. Mm -hmm. And still, you read it today, and it sounds just as natural as if 
Yes. She was speaking it today. And the same with Mark Twain. And that, of course, is genius to, uh, to carry that quality along. That's right. Now, I want to talk also about being here in the middle of Aroostook County mm -hmm. at your old campsite. Now, yep. this, this was not the first camp no. on this site. No, I first had a camp here in 1948-49. Uh, it was one of the old Aroostook camps with the logs over the porch, like this, but all log construction. And that burned in 1987. And my brother Dwayne and I, who's Dwayne's co-owner of this place, built this in... Oh, 87, 88, 89, and mm -hmm. we're, we're very happy with would you, it. Would you build it out of odds and ends? Yeah, these are uh, leftover pieces from Northern Products Log Homes <laughs> in Bangor, and they were $5 a pickup truckload when we <laughs> first put them together. And we had lots and lots of help. Did your friend Stanley, whom you call Eben in your stories? Uh, uh, Stanley did, was here a lot. Did yeah. he have something to do with it? Okay. Well, you haven't seen Stan. I'm looking forward to going down under the hill and saying hello. Oh, I want to meet him. He's yep. a legend. Yeah. And then you started, would you start writing stories right away about it? Or just, you kept a journal, didn't you? Yes. Uh, when Stan, Stan and I spent a part of a fall here in 1950, and I kept a journal then, and, and it's, to a writer's eye, it's a mess, but Mm -hmm. Nostalgia wipes out all the <laughs> clumsiness, and I'm just so glad that I uh, have it. Because it makes it easier when you're writing your stories. Right, right? it, it makes that. it easier in this back trail, yes, the new book. What, what, what are you trying to get down in your stories? The, the, book, the books we should mention, My Big Buck and So Long Scout, those are your stories about this area. Yeah, those are fiction stories. Well, I don't know. They're, some of them, some of the accounts in them are true, some are fictionalized, some, some are holy fiction, mm -hmm. just made up. I guess this is the way back to the camp, isn't it? This is it. Yep. I'm always fascinated by old camps in the woods, and here's a little piece I wrote about them, in, or about one in my big buck. I always like to go in and poke around. As a matter of fact, I think I couldn't go by them without stopping, and it's the same with any old camp. It seems to me that a deserted camp is the saddest, most nostalgic thing in the world. You squeeze in through a door, which seldom opens fully, only a foot or so. Then the minute you're inside, the emptiness and desertion strike you. You think of all the good times the old camp has witnessed, the lies that were swat, the cribbage that was played, the good-natured joshing. You think of the fine meals that have been eaten there, game and fish and bacon sizzling for breakfast. You think of what a cheery sight it must have been to the returning hunter or hunters when it was a lived-in place with lamplight in the windows and how good they must have felt when they stepped through the door and were in their woods homes with their buddies. That's the most nostalgic thing of all, thinking of those old times and old friendships. The empty old camps echo it all. I've got to have a cop to get back into the contest. I didn't. Talk about male bonding, too, the whole hunting scene, you know, the whole business of coming into the woods, getting away from the clearing, as you call it. Yeah, everything outside of here is the clearing. Well, it's, it's great to be with a bunch of guys and uh, play cribbage and swap lies and, <laughs> and just have a good time in camp. Right. I don't care so much about, I don't care at all anymore about hunting and fishing, or hunting at all. I still like to fish. But uh, the idea of going to camp, just being in camp, mm -hmm. and not necessarily this camp, just a camp. Right. You know, I, I like camps. And tell how camps have changed. You yeah. know, this is the real main camp well, that you've got here. But. The one next door, the Bancroft camp that's owned by Bob Raymond now, that's a good old camp, and Stan's camp's a good old camp. Uh, <clears throat> some, of them, some of the things that are built today don't have the aesthetic appeal that the old mm -hmm. places do. Did. They seem yeah. like suburban houses out in well, the middle of the main some woods. Some of them do, yes, and they have the television. Yeah. And why bother to come up here? That's know? right. Why that's, bother? That's right. What's the point exactly? Yeah. So what would happen in a, on a hunt on a typical day here during hunting season? On a typical day, well, if we had hunters in camp, if my brother Dwayne was here, or my nephew, nephews Raymond or Dwayne Jr., they'd be up early and uh, make themselves a breakfast because the old man, me, I wouldn't be up making them a breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> in the ungodly hour, and they'd be out uh, looking for for deer sign and for deer. But this country is very poor in deer lately. The clear cutting, I think, is in the coyotes. And uh, it used to be a good deer country, but... Not anymore? No, it has by far the fewest doe permits, antlerless deer permits in the state, this mm -hmm. area. Oh, for heaven's sake. Yeah. You but you have, mo you have moose here, don't oh, you? Oh, there's moose and moose and moose here. No. Bear? Strange we didn't see one coming in. Yes, lots of bear. Mm -hmm. This is heavily hunted for bear during bear season for different 
mm -hmm. lodges around. Bird hunting? Do you come here for yeah, bird hunting yeah, too? Yeah. And what so partridge hunting they used to be though? We, I remember killing partridge with a stick. They were just so, <laughs> yeah, they were so tame. And you'd shoot at a partridge and it would sit there and sit there. And you'd just shoot, hit the branch it was on, it wobbled back and forth. And, mm -hmm. But they were tame. And, Here's a section from the Major and his merry band, a story that's in So Long Scout. I had just arrived in camp for an extended hunting trip. The late October day was perfect, and Eben sat on the sunny porch cleaning his old wingmaster shotgun. He'd written that there were plenty of partridge around and a good deal of deer sign, too. I'd gotten most everything squared away back on the farm and was looking forward to a fine vacation. But as I was walking up the trail, I'd been shocked to see a new structure in the clearing not far from Evans and my camp. The brilliant leaves obscured most of it, but what I could see was certainly as out of place as, I don't know what, a burger franchise in St. Peter's Square, perhaps. I never got to know those people well, but one of them felt that everything should be in order. He was nasty neat. Mm -hmm, everything should mm -hmm. be almost military and the guys should have their shoes lined up under the bunks and the bunks should be made up with hospital corners and, and they put up with this stuff for quite a while. And then they drove him out of camp and he built another place that he called his chalet next to theirs. But he was, he was excommunicated from them. <laughs> but uh, just that was an idea for, for that story. That story, yeah. that's one of your best stories, well, I think. Well, thank you. It's an excellent story. Yeah. Uh, also, the language you just said, nasty neat. Right. That's an old expression. Yeah. People who are like that. Right. And words like plague. But you don't hear that word anymore. No. Because it's no. based on plague. You know, they, they say, don't right. plague him. So down, down home, that's what they would say. Right. Stop and, plaguing her. And as we all know, the plague was nothing funny. So no, plague not, was not at all. Business. No, and speaking of that, while we're on that topic, How to Talk Yankee, uh, how do you classify that book? As a reference, as, as literature? I call it my comic book. Your comic it, book. It, Why? It, well, because it's illustrated in a comic book fashion by Tim Sample. Uh, by Tim Sample, and uh, because of its size and the format of it, I guess, and so forth. But it's accurate. Well, it has been quite accurate. Yeah, it's very accurate. You did a good I've job always on been it. quite sensitive. Uh, I know when I hear myself. I know when I see this. I'll say that. What a voice! Isn't that awful? <laughs> I do sound like an awful hick, but I've always been interested in that main language. And when I was in the army, of course, thrown in at first, when I went out to Denver, I was in a, a hospital and I was thrown in with a bunch of yahoos, southerners, and they all talked alike. I didn't. And, mm -hmm. I, and nobody talked like me anyway. No, you know, that's I, right. He was a maniac. Right. And uh, I was very conscious of that, but, uh, but not ashamed of it. Uh, Kind of proud of it, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I like the main. I love to hear main. I love the main accent yeah. too. But I, but I didn't as a kid. Growing yeah. up, I did feel like a hick. Yeah. Because yeah. Of the, and and when you went to college, people made fun of you, that and they called happen. you New Englander, and they tried to change your speech patterns and so on and so forth. But it, now I love it. I mean, you don't hear it enough. Yeah. You want to hear it. It's great. I have an anecdote about that. I, I was in Holland for a year teaching over there, and there was a meeting of all the Fulbright people who had been in the United States and. American Fulbrighters who were there in Holland, and it was in a big, big room, like some kind of a banquet or something. And a girl, a young lady, came from all the way across the room. She had heard me over the babble of <laughs> hundreds of people in there, and came over and said, you're from Maine. And I said, well, yes, I am. How'd you know that? She was Dutch, and she had spent a year in Maine, and she recognized that she heard it. Maine accent. Yeah, the distinguishing accent yeah. that we have. Up there is where you did all your reading. Oh, everything. Yeah. Hundreds of books. Sit there and read and eat, dream and eat raisins. Eat raisins. <laughs> and, that, and that gets me to ask, a man who grows up on the coast in Booth Bay Harbor, how come you write so many hunting and fishing and inland stories? Well, for the last 30 years, of course, I've lived inland. And even when I was living here, I was very much interested in hunting and fishing. Right, and, right. And in reading about hunting and fishing, the McDougall stories. and. And I was always a great reader of, uh, of everything, but outdoor magazines too. But when you, you, Dexter was where you taught most of the time, and that's where you yes. had your farm. Yes. You write about that too. Yes. Uh, raising sheep. Raising, we raised everything there, but we thought it'd be good for the kids, the three children, to have uh, exposure to 
family. Pigs. We always had pigs. Uh -huh. And uh, we had a horse, which had a colt. Which, that was nice. We always had a, an annual steer. It was always a handful for me. Uh, of course, we had sheep. We had, at one point, I think we may have had 60 sheep. And that was good for the kids to take care of them and groom them and show them at fairs. Jerry, right where we're sitting here with the setting of the burned out hulks of the boats, uh, this is the setting of one of your most famous stories, one of your best stories, I think. Well, thank you. It's, it's nice to have a compliment. Uh, I guess maybe I thought that if I wrote that piece for the National Fisherman, it would uh, expunge the instant from my mind. But as I've told my students and others, you have to get the setting of V.J. Knight. Mm -hmm. It was just delirious. Anything went. Um, this was August 1945. Aug August 1945. End of was, World War II. And I was a senior in high school. And we will never know a moment of such release and relief as that night because mm -hmm. the boys were coming home and it was right. all the misery was over. So we, uh, in town here, we rang our own church bells and we rang other people's church bells and danced, snake danced through the streets and uh, huh. kissed any girl that we wanted. I remember seeing one man who will not be identified and a woman being very intimate uh, standing up in the doorway of Cedar's drugstore. <laughs> and that, that, that was just something that was accepted. Mm -hmm. And then somebody had the idea that uh, it would be appropriate to, to burn the vessels. There were five of them here, I think, and they were wonderful playgrounds for kids, and it was a terrible thing to do. Were they still working vessels? They well, the one used? that we burned was uh, in good shape and, in fact, had good furniture stored aboard it, so it wasn't a wreck. Uh -huh. you know, it, was, uh -huh. it was all right. It wasn't a working ship. Well, we got up there and then got down in the cabin of it, and uh, somebody found an old mattress full of straw and piled it up against the bulkhead and lit it. And we were immediately in trouble because it, the, the fumes were very accurate from that thing. And there was no light. We hadn't had brains enough to bring flashlights. But then there was light from the fire, and we were suffocating, really. And by then, people were out gazing at it, and they had flashlights, and they were pointing them. That's Jerry Lewis, that's Pud Lewis's boy, I know him. I'm gonna tell his father, blah, blah. It was horrible. Yeah. <clears throat> and after that, I hid out in the woods up in Mount Pisgah for three days. I slept at home, but I, I was sure I was going to the Wyndham Reformatory. <laughs> Uh, what other stories have you written about Booth Bay? You haven't written that many about Booth Bay, No, have you? no. Uh, there was one in the Up Here in Maine book called Nine Little Lobsters, a misadventure my old pal Stanley and I had. We borrowed, you can tra translate that to stole a boat. We went off Indian Town Island, which is a lovely place, a great place to look for Indian relics when I was a kid and hauled other people's traps and took only short lobsters. We thought that was, you know, quite uh -huh. ethical. If uh -huh. we, didn't, we weren't robbing if we, told, right. we took only short lobsters. We they had, were nine little lobsters. Yeah, we took, <laughs> well, we had 36, uh -huh. and we ate uh, 17. Uh -huh. <laughs> and for once, I ate more than Stanley did. I had nine lobsters, and he had eight, <laughs> cooked over an outdoor fire there, and one of Mother's canners, and with a case of Budweiser and a pound of oleo, it was a true glut. Stanley poked in his eighth and barely managed to get it down before he fell backward in a stupor. I chuckled, had my ninth, and I too conked out. End of a glorious feed. It was another story when the cold dawn broke upon two shivering young poachers, besmeared by lobster juice and Tom Alley, with a borrowed so-called boat and the 20 remaining sharks in the light of day for all to see. But we got out of it somehow, and back on the mainland, we divvied up the 20 from which our mothers made stews, from which they made delicious stews, of which they were not proud. <laughs> but they must have figured boys will be boys, for I don't remember getting hassled very badly. But maybe that too has slipped my mind. Oh, that's great. How were you as a student? Oh, I, I was uh, very close to the bottom of my class, <laughs> very close. I just was totally irresponsible and rebellious. And uh, just a pain in the ass to all the teachers. I was uh, suspended, I don't know how many times, and expelled three times. Three times they said, Lewis, that's it, out, you're gone. Your history, you ain't never gonna come back. But then uh, the school board or the teachers or the administration say, well, we can't do that, break poor old Winnie's heart, let the little jerk back in. Back <laughs> in I'd come and then I'd do something awful and out I'd go again. And it was all, uh, but maybe it's part of a grand design because I became a teacher myself and I know yes. that I was much more patient with 
the same kind of kid. The same kind of kid. Do you feel disappointed or angry about your literary career? Mm, guilty, I guess. Guilty. That I, <laughs> yes, that I haven't done more. Mm -hmm. I see people, you know, getting along my age, and I have friends who are passing on, and and I think, well, I at least have a chance to do something. Why the hell don't I do it? So what were your habits? And you went back to teaching. Did you write every day on the weekends? When I was most productive, uh, I did write every day. I'd get up at uh, 6 in the morning and, and work for an hour and a half. And that little bit of time, you can uh, uh -huh. get an amazing amount. A lot of teachers write that way. And I now, do that, too. Yeah, now I don't. And why on the subject, why uh, undisciplined, lazy, <laughs> used to be, has been, maybe never was, writer, you know, the subject of this, uh, I'm not sure, but I lost the fire in the belly there for a while, but maybe I'll... Uh, regain it, I maybe hope I'll, so. I'll you regain. better. Teaching didn't inspire you to, nope. to, to write. That was a job, and this was something mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. You kept them separate, actually. Yeah, I guess so. But you, but you did them at the same time. Yeah. You really, you really did, yep. all, all along. Uh, now, I want to talk about, I guess, the, the teaching career. You haven't written much about your teaching career, nope. have you? Not much. No. Not at all. That I know don't know of any stories or any essays of, of your teaching career. I, I get, one thing comes to mind. When I first started teaching in Deer Isle, I didn't know any more about grammar than the goose knows about God. I was <laughs> terrible because in school I'd never paid any attention to it whatsoever. But I want to acknowledge here, although I have, there was a girl in this class named Athelda Powers, and she was a sweetheart and much, much ahead of her teacher. And she would ask me, uh, uh, somebody, some kid in class would ask me, what's the difference between a predicate noun and a direct object, Mr. Lewis? They both come after the verb. What indeed <laughs> is the difference? So I'd say, well, what do you think of Felder? And she'd always give me the right answer. Mm -hmm. She'd say, well, Mr. Lewis, the predicate noun comes after the verb, but it means the same thing as the subject, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so she bailed me out. I, she never said, well, you dope, you're getting paid for this, why don't you answer? Well, how would you, well, I guess what I want to ask is, how would you classify yourself as a writer? Uh, you, do you want to be called a uh, humorist, uh, an essayist, a journalist, or just a plain old storyteller? Uh, essayist, I think. An essayist, basically. You see your short stories as even essays, too? No, not really, but essay, you know, literally it means to try. To that's right, yes, that's it's French, right. but to try, <laughs> that's right, that's right. Well, that's that's appropriate, I guess. Right, and, and if you're really good at essays, and you are, it's almost like writing poetry, wouldn't you say? When it comes out, well... Had you fooled around with poetry? I mean, you like poetry. Uh, oh, yes, very, very much. Well, mm -hmm. pe people who say they're poets, you know, I see this damnedest tripe and garbage mm -hmm. published by people who say they're poets. Oh, right. now, re really good poetry is understandable and, and mm -hmm. moving. That's right. You don't need any... any it's doesn't like need a, to be explained. It's like a good cartoon. It's immediate. Mm, you know, you don't right. need to figure it out. That's right. But no, I'm not a poet. Once in a while, there'll be a poetic image, I suppose. But Did you ever try writing a novel? I've got a great idea for a novel. It's called Falling. Mm -hmm. Fallen? Falling. Falling. Yeah, I have a fear of heights, and it's about a guy who witnesses an indiscretion of, on his wife's part while he's climbing a tree. I used to be a tree surgeon, and you mm -hmm. see that stuff when you look down. Mm -hmm. And he <laughs> falls out of this tree, and then he's, then if I ever get it down, it's an idea. Anyway. Have you started writing no. it? No. Never have. It's all in my head. That's a good place for it, ain't it? Uh, yeah, yes. <laughs> Visit our website for more information about a good read and the writers featured in this series, including a transcript of the interviews, biographies of each of the authors, a complete list of their published works, some tips on how to find those books, what's on their own must-read book list, and more. Production of A Good Read on Maine PBS is made possible in part by the Davis Family Foundation. Good hand to have right there. And here I've got 
15-2, 15 Oops. Is that it? <laughs> I think so. You ain't much competition. <laughs> no, I'm not. 